Welcome back to the second part of our discussion of French Baroque, focusing mainly on architecture and sculpture. We'll also be looking at English Baroque architecture as well. So uh, the main aspect or most important thing probably to take away from this is to remember the aspects of the Palace of Versailles. So let's get right to it. The architects who worked on Versailles did multiple projects throughout uh, France that were similar to the things that you see. These are the types of palaces that the aristocracy was kind of use, used to having. So the royal families throughout Western Europe, of course, had more than one individual Renaissance, uh, sorry, residence. And so those um, buildings needed to house multiple people, servants, uh, courtiers, etc. And it was not unusual for uh, the families to move from palace to palace at different times. So the architects who worked specifically on Versailles had made other massive projects that were really well known. Louis Laveau uh, was one of the architects of the renovations of Versailles, and he also uh, did some work, uh, very important work, at the Louvre Museum. So you see, uh, of course, it did not begin its its life as the museum. It initially was a palace as well. And you can see some of his work here. You can also see the work of Cotre uh, was well known as a landscape architect, so you get a sense of what these great houses were like when you look at the symmetry of the architect the use of elaborate types of references to uh, the classical orders, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, emphasizing Ionic and Corinthian probably than any other. Um, definite attention to directing your eye to a central focus and keeping kind of a symmetrical structure throughout. And then uh, important attention to how the landscape around the house could be controlled. And many wealthy, powerful families throughout Europe had similar homes to these, but Versailles becomes, of course, the most iconic one. So there are a lot of um, examples. I included these videos in your discussion board area, I believe, um, to give you a tour and a quick history of the background of Versailles. Of course, we've already talked about Louis uh, XIV and his kind of elaborate sense of style. Well, he was by far one of the most powerful period, and he very much controlled the power, um, or the lives rather, of the people in his court. And one of his master strokes, really, in controlling the court was his decision to move his permanent palace from his residence in Paris to just a few miles away at Versailles. And this is essentially the layout of Versailles. So at first glance, you might think you're looking at lots of small rooms on complicated hallways. In fact, the palace is this tiny bit right here. And what you're seeing the majority of the complex of Versailles is given over to the architectural landscape. So we can refer to these landscape architects as really transforming um, how the aristocracy used large open air spaces, and they had a massive impact even on our own culture, believe it or not, the uh, designs of Versailles have an impact on great houses in America, including the gardens at, uh, I suddenly can't say it, Biltmore House <laughs> in Asheville, and also the layout of uh, Central Park in New York. All of those things really root for us here. So the complex of, of the building is one part, but the massive architecture of the garden is another. The ground was fairly had to be painted, leveled. I mean, they really transformed this space completely to make it the seat of power of the French court. And they created three roads. You can kind of see two roads coming here, here, and one in the center that would lead you straight into the courtyards, the statue of Louis, and toward the entrance. You knew that when you arrived at this place, you were being confronted by the most powerful man example in color really gives you a sense of people arriving to kind of initiate the king's uh, residence. You can see how, vast, even from this view, how vast the gardens really truly were. 
um, and still are. You can also see the complex of buildings around it, the small town kind of springs up to support the palace itself. But remember, if the king's court is meeting in Paris, then many of the courtiers are their own townhomes within the city of Paris, not so much here at Versailles. So if he moves the court and you want to maintain your position in the good, you have to move as well. And so he was able to really consolidate his power. So the king was definitely interested in taking a building had and transforming it. So the initial hunting lodge had then to be kind of renovated and wrapped with all this new architecture. And so the building begins to change. Here's our initial phase and how the palace grows into its final state. So you can really see the enlargement of this from a still grand building, certainly by my standards, it's bigger than any house I'm ever going to be able to afford. But by the end, Versailles, the initial building itself is kind of dwarfed by all of these remarkable additions. So the first big phase expansion is directed by Louis Laveau. The second phase of the enlargement is controlled or directed by Rodin Massart. And so we have two architects' names to really be aware of. The plan itself, you can kind of see how it lays out here. The map within the building that is the king's primary uh, dwellings, as well as uh, the private suite for queen, which of course is much smaller. The king's chambers are all of these. The more public spaces are here, and we'll take a look at not only the chapel, but all the mirrors and the two salon that are on either side of that. All of this side faces to the gardens, so it gives you a of how you would enter the court and then exit out into the garden space. This is the three roads leading in. So from Paris straight to the heart of the palace, pretty remarkable um, accomplished in terms of engineering. This is another view that shows you the beginning of the gardens and they are spectacular. It's hard to believe that they're natural they're not just like, I don't know, astroturf or painted concrete, that all of that is grass and plants in these incredible patterns. It's really rather an accomplishment. You can see the gardens themselves have been kind of forced into these arabesques and geometric shapes. It's as the will of the king has transformed nature itself. That incredible uh, lagoon as well could be... Um, putting boats on for parties, reverie, all kinds of activities could take place in this garden, but it's almost every view is meticulously organized by Lenotre, the landscape architect, to redirect your attention back to the palace. So even though it looks in some areas natural. Really, if you were walking around in here, you would be seeing very manicured, controlled, specifically organized views almost as if they were making in three dimensions and in reality with real living plants, as if they were making the paintings that we saw by Claude and by Poussin. There's also an area, and we'll see this a little bit later, there is a small fake village, peasant the grounds. This was a play village for Marie Antoinette to pretend to be a poor person. So we'll talk a little in some depth a little bit later. This map gives you a sense of the overall intricacy of the garden plan. It is by far the largest of the entire uh, building complex. There are lots of statues throughout, and one of the most important ones is the statue of Lou in the courtyard. So as you walk up to it, the building just kind of dwarfs you, and you have to pass by the statue. You know you're going to see. One of the things that I really like, in a way, about this from a propaganda point of view is that he controls everything about your experience. In fact, men were required to wear a sword as part of your formal attire. And if you didn't have one, there was literally a stall that would 
face so that you could attend court properly dressed. The king was meticulous about his control of every aspect of life. In fact, there's an entire room that is essentially a closet, I suppose, for his collection of colognes and perfumes. He wouldn't allow one else to even certain scents were reserved for the king and the king alone. He controlled the daily life of his court for sure and certain. And it looks like a spectacular residence. I'm certain that he enjoyed himself. I don't know how much the courtiers enjoyed serving him, but tell that he did. This would be the view if I were to use this piece um, as an identification. You would see the back view, the view from the garden looking at the of the palace. And so this section, begun by Laveau, but completed by Khardam Assam after Laveau's death. The interior decoration was directed by Charles Lebrun, who was also the president of the French Academy. The gardens, uh, the landscape architect is Le Notre. So the two architects' names are the ones to focus on when looking just at the uh, structural architecture of the building itself. You can see referencing earlier you can also see the tendency to pair columns is happening here at Versailles as well as in other the same architects and you can see that every surface is really an excuse to add statues and decoration in any place the gardens you really start to get a sense that when you're taking a picture of anything that you think is interesting in the garden it's also kind of framing for you a view of the palace itself. So really, in the gardens, you can't escape from recognizing the power of the king. One of the many fountains on the site, Neptune Fountain. This is the Dragon Fountain. The Apollo Fountain. And don't the gardens kind of remind you of these paintings by Poussin and by Claude Lorraine? It really is odd to think about someone deciding where to plant each one of these trees and to sculpt the landscape lagoon effect. It's it seems natural, but it's absolutely perfect in its composition because it was absolutely a landscape architect. Some of the exotic plants that have been brought and kind of forced to uh, live in this in planted in very regimented rows and patterns throughout the gardens. The king's chambers are pretty fascinating to consider, and what you're seeing is his bedroom, and not only is there a rope there to keep you from getting too close, but that balustrade would have been there anyway. The king favored his favorite courtiers with certain tasks, like being there to hand him his slippers when he first arose in the morning. The life of the court was really the life of the king, and you were required to be awake and dressed and ready to go before the king got up, to stay up and willing to do whatever the king wanted to do. If that meant partying until three in the morning, then you had to last that long or you were going to lose your position in court. So he literally would have people kneeling at the foot of his bed waiting for him to wake up. He had absolute authority. The people here. Um, if you think of it as his house, then he doesn't even have to leave his house to go to church. God comes to him. He's got a chapel, a church in the palace itself. That's in his home, if you can imagine it. It's just an astonishing level of wealth. This gives you a good view of one of the most important rooms in the uh, Palace of Versailles. This is one of the either side of the long hall of mirrors, and you can see that hall through this entrance. So this is like a panorama of the entire room all the way around. The decoration, the use of marble, gilding, sculpture everywhere, painting everywhere. There are um, two very important salons, the Salon of War and the Salon of Peace. This is the Peace Room. The decoration was undertaken by Charles Lebrun, and Lebrun was the chief artist of the court, but he was also the director of the Art Academy of France. He also wrote 
fiction books for artists, and some of them are really quite fascinating. Uh, he wrote a book that translates loosely into English as Methods for Describing the Passion the emotions. So allegorical facial expressions were very much part of what LeBron's uh, teaching was all about. So here's Henry, a view of it that show us a view down the hall of mirrors from the room of peace. Are some of the other illustrations from another book of LeBron's drawings, which tried to kind of connect the concept of human to their similarity to animals. And of course, he's exaggerated them somewhat, but really, if you look carefully at them, you can see some uh, similarities, probably in some features, people that you know. We certainly um, sometimes describe someone as having like a, a nose like a bee. Dream is this example of the parrot. But you can see some animal characteristics. Some people do have kind of cat-like or feline appearances. Certainly some people's appearance might be similar to a lion, perhaps. You can kind of see him playing with these ideas of similar features in human beings to features in animals. From his book on expressing the humans, isn't that awesome that he's literally labeled them so that an artist would learn exactly how to put the muscles of the face to express a specific emotion? It's almost like a code system. So when we talk about those allegorical gestures, it's not just the face as well that is meant to be readable, that we understand what those emotions are meant to express. That faith is pretty clear to us. The One of the salon to know for the test is the one dedicated to war, the salon de la guerre or the war room, which includes sculptural reliefs of his defeated enemies bound in garland chains, and also the king himself riding the vanquished, which um, was pretty unlikely for him to actually do in the real world, especially in his full-on wig, but you do see that it is propaganda of the state. This is art supporting the person in power, after all. Lebrun is the art director for the entire uh, complex, the entire palace, but Kosovo is the sculptor known for the pieces, particularly here in the LeBron is in charge, but he is really more in charge, ultimately, of deciding the types of things. Kosovo is in charge of creating the sculptural works. This is another room to know for the purposes of the test, the Hall of Mirrors or Galerie de Glacé. It is a beautiful space in which the windows that face out into the garden are perfectly mirrored in size and number and by mirrors on the opposite wall. So it creates the effect that you're actually walking through a hallway that's kind of a tunnel um, with exterior views on the incredible elaborate ceiling painting. I mean, obviously, uh, Karachi would have loved this, right? It's a huge space. In There's carving and gilding absolutely everywhere, different colors and patterns of marble and these flattened columns or pilasters with their Corinthian capitals, there's chandeliers, it's just excess. Now, if you can believe it, when we hit the Rococo, this room is going to seem a little bit compared to how excessive this taste for decoration is going to become by the time we turn to the 1700s. The Galerie de Glacé, or the Hall of Mirrors, was also the site of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles that ended the First World War. That's what's depicted in this painting here. Some works by Kosovo, the sculptor, uh, include the uh, portrait busts. See him to the right, but also of one of his generals, the Grand Combe, to the left. And you see them imitating his style. The also in um, Baroque style and leading us into the Rococo in uh, France in particular, could also be located out of in grotto or in kind of niches of stone um, out in uh, gardens. And we see that happening again and again throughout the Baroque into the Rococo. 
So it's almost as though the sculptures are like actors in a play that's happening in the out of doors. Pierre Pouget is another sculptor to know from this period. You want to know his Milo of Kryptona. This piece is really kind of a disturbing one. Milo was a Greek actor. He got his hand stuck. I'm not sure what he was trying to do, but he got his hand stuck in a stump and couldn't get it out. And while he was trapped there, he was attacked. So you see the lion just tearing into the muscle of his thigh, and really he's in a bit of extreme pain. So it's much movement and dynamism that we would have seen in the Renaissance. It certainly is not a subject that you would have seen in ancient Greece, but that is the hallmark of what the Baroque is all about. Pouget was a little bit over the top even for Louis XIV's taste, so he was not his favorite sculptor, but he did a few decorations for Ver uh, and then some of those were moved from the palace, of course, to the Louvre. Other Puget pieces really show you that over-the-top allegorical gesture and movement and drama that is so common to the Baroque. Definitely want to be aware as well. Of course, we remember that Palladio was the architect of the Renaissance who was reviving all these ideas from Greece and Rome, and those are designs of his from the Renaissance, and that influence is going to continue into the Baroque, especially in England. And so when we think about Palladio's design, we really see that uh, influence here in the work of the British architect Inigo Jones. Inigo Jones was very much a fan of Palladio's Italian for his design for the banqueting house, where we've already seen the paintings done uh, by uh, Peter Paul Rubens for the royal family. Kind of awesome, right? You can also see how much of an influence Inigo Jones had on our own culture. That building that you see there was is Brick Colonies. Uh, that building is now in what is what is now Rhode Island, and you can see the imitation of the all half moon uh, decorations above the windows is absolutely an imitation of this building, but in a cheaper, easier to use material that was available in the colonies of brick. Definitely we see Inigo Jones kind of restrained, Palladian style, very popular. This is the Queen's House, built for Anne of Denmark. And you can see a more elaborate style in the work of Christopher Wren. Sir Christopher Wren, influential architect, this is his signature most important building. This is St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And a Major buildings that either had to be renovated or completely rebuilt after a massive fire that took place in the year 1666 and redesigned to Wren's style and specification. And that is very much the case of St. Paul's Cathedral. You can see those double columns, and in fact, a double portico or double porch, one on top of the other, and double columns. So, in the style of Baroque, excess is good even for British architects. And so if anything's worth doing once, it's worth doing twice. One column, two would be better. One porch, two would be better. One tower. You definitely can see the designs of Christopher Wren in this painting by the Italian painter Canaletto, and we'll look at his work a little bit. But what you're seeing here is a hospital design by Christopher Wren. It was so influential that it made its way as a landmark into paintings that were meant to be sold what this is, there's a photograph of the building itself, really quite beautiful, and you can see the influence of Chris Wren in, believe it or not, you will see the design here in England is very much the model for the design of what has been nicknamed the Wren Building at William & Mary College in Virginia, so a massive influence across the ocean. 